a young man named Wells stands upon a rocky plain, unease clear in his expression. An array of hostile men surround him, looking ready to attack at any given time. These fellas look twice this teenage-looking brunette's age. So you just know that it's going to be a battle of epic shonen proportions. Said brunette summons a magic spell that instantly flattens the ground. When the dust settles, a formally dressed man smiles and announces, All right, everyone, get to work. Wait, what? Where's the fight sequence? Where's the fully grown men beefing with a kid? Well, it turns out the hostile men are actually workers who need to dig up the ground. The young man just flattened the ground to make their job easier. A blonde man compliments well, saying that his magic is useful. While in the site, a worker comments that he can't believe the Count's magic is being used for land development. The young Count tells Roderich, the man overseeing the work, that he'll be heading back now. Before he can leave, though, Roderich asks him to flatten another parcel of land. Well looks terrified as this plot looks a lot rockier than the previous one. Good luck, Well. Finally, he teleports back home. As he announces his return, he is greeted by three young girls. Elisa serves everyone tea and comments that Well looks tired. He agrees with this, saying that Roderich ran him into the ground again today. The three girls comment that his relationship with Roderich seems topsy-turvy. It's like Roderich is the boss, not the Count. At that, Well muses that he'll always be a white-collar office worker at heart no matter how far he goes. A what? Elisa doesn't know what white-collar means and asks him about it. Sensing that he might have slipped up, Well excuses himself to get changed. Once he's on his own, he recalls that it was just 10 years ago when he was an office worker. He used to live in modern-day Japan. One day, after coming home late from work, he prepared his meal. But while he was waiting for the rice to get cooked, his vision started blurring and he passed out. When he wakes up, he finds himself in the body of a little kid in a completely different environment. He's dressed very differently, and he's in a party with people he doesn't know. He asks himself if he's overseas, but soon discovers that the people are speaking Japanese. He tries going back to sleep to return to reality, but someone wakes him. He still has that kid's body, and an older man towers over him, saying that he has to greet everyone. The older man introduces him as his youngest son before asking him to introduce himself to everyone else. The boy man, man boy, is stumped. He doesn't know what to say. Hell, he doesn't even know what his name is. A young man named Eric greets the crowd instead. He thanks them for coming all the way there for their brother Kurt's wedding. He introduces the little kid as Wendelin von Bino Baumeister, his younger brother. Kurt's bride decides to call him well, and Eric gives him a drink, asking if he blanked out when he found himself surrounded by adults. Well asks his older brother what's happening, and Eric concludes that this might be a little too complicated for a five-year-old. Eric explains that it is their older brother Kurt's wedding, and his bride is Amelie, the second daughter of the nobleman, Sir Mainbach. Well asks that if a noble's daughter is marrying into their family, are they by chance nobles too? Eric replies yes, they are genuine nobility too. Well observes his surroundings and finds that he can read their language as well. He surmises that if they can throw such a lavish party, they must be of high rank. If he's the third brother, then he won't need to worry about starving. With that, he enjoys the good food and the cheery atmosphere to the fullest. What a turn of events! From being a corpo slave to being the third son of such affluent nobility, this sounds too good to be true. And, well, it is. The next morning comes as a massive disappointment to Well. They only have hard, dry bread and soup for breakfast. Whatever happened to being a noble family? He looks around their house and finds that it is a bit dilapidated, which only means that they're poor nobles. Oof. The boy looks for Eric to ask about it, and the man scoffs at his delusions of being up the echelon. Sure, they had a smashing party the other day, but that's because they can't be cheapskates with their guests. They may be poor, but they still have noble pride. Last night's dinner was just a special menu, and now they're back to brown bread and light soup. As they're outside the house talking, more and more of Wells' brothers show up. It is then that he discovers he is the eighth son of a poor noble family. Eighth? One day, he studies the map of the new world he's living in. Compared to more prosperous towns, his family's territory is a lot sadder. They have a population of 800. Most of the residents are old, and there isn't much going on. As he walks outside, he laments that his new life is screwed. Well comes across his brothers leaving, and Eric explains that they all agreed to leave once Kurt got married. They're not inheriting the land anyway, so they decided to give up their succession rights for monetary settlement and leave home. So at that very moment, they are no longer nobles. Well asks them how they are supposed to live. One of his brothers replies that since Herman is the second son, he married into the Branch family in case anything happened to Kurt. Now, they'll have to find their own path in life in the capital. And with that, Well's three brothers are off to forge their own lives. As he watches his brothers leave, a determined look crosses Well's face. 
While looking into their home library, Well comes across a crystal ball and an instruction pamphlet. The paper says that the crystal ball can measure one's aptitude for magic. Though he doesn't entertain the idea of magic, he continues to read the instructions anyway. It states that everyone possesses mana, but only one in thousands of people has enough of it to cast magic spells. Such people are extremely rare. Magical aptitude isn't hereditary either, so everyone has an equal chance of possessing the talent to be a great magician. He tries to project his mana into the crystal, but it has no effect. Just as Well's about to give up and leave, the crystal ball shines a rainbow color, surprising him. According to the manual, rainbow colors mean that you have a high aptitude for magic. In such occasion, one should look for specialized guides to further instruct them. Furthermore, um, uh, yeah, that's all the information the pamphlet has. Somewhere in a forest, a man looks around his surroundings. It seems that he has sensed Well's magic. Well starts rummaging through the bookshelves in search of a book on magic, but he doesn't find any. His dad arrives and he asks him if they have other books, but the man answers no and that he can't read. He then asks him to go to the forest and pick up some firewood. In the forest, Well tries all sorts of things to activate his magic, but none of his attempts are successful. Suddenly, a man descends from the sky and approaches him, saying that he finally found someone on the same wavelength as himself. He gets close and asks Well for his name, but the kid gets terrified of him. Stranger danger, my guy. The man realizes this too and tells him there's no need to be afraid of him and introduces himself as a magician. He throws the stick well waved at him. For some reason, this causes a part of the ground to break off, hitting a wild boar in the process. And that's just a twig. The wild boar spots them and Well gets scared for his life. While trying to make a run for it, the magician pulls his hand and asks him to picture his own wind magic directed at the wild boar. Though he's scared, Well follows the man's instructions, and he manages to conjure some wind magic. This blows the boar away, but not enough to defeat it. So the magician takes care of the rest. With that, he introduces himself as the former court magician of the dukedom of Bleichroder. His name is Alfred Rainford. Rest assured, Alfred says, you will become a magician far greater than I. After some time, Well and Alfred are sitting at a table in the middle of the forest. He serves the boy a drink, which looks way better than whatever his family was having. Alfred reveals that he wants to pass on his magic to him because he wants a disciple. This lights a hope in little Well, who's eager to learn magic. He even calls Alfred master. This makes Alfred smile, and he asks him to keep this magic business between the two of them. If people find out that Well can use magic, some retainers or subjects might insist on his lordship, which can lead to a succession dispute. Magicians hold more power than he thinks, Alfred says. Well could become the rightful successor and the next lord in a heartbeat. And since he's still a child, it might be dangerous for him to be called that. At the dining table in his decrepit home, Well looks at his older brother Kurt, the current successor. He ponders what Alfred said about magicians being considered better successors. The next day comes, which marks the beginning of Well's training. First off, Alfred has Well match capacities, a training method where one can match their mana capacity to someone who has more. Well holds hands with him and concentrates on his mana. The boy sees light, a lot of them in fact, and realizes that it might be his mentor's mana. Alfred tells the little kid that a person's maximum mana capacity is determined at birth and it doesn't increase any further. He thought that Well wouldn't reach his capacity, but he matched and even surpassed it. And get this, that's not even Well's maximum mana capacity. At the Baumeister home library, Well's father is staring at the crystal ball. Kurt comes in and the father notes that the crystal ball has been moved. He soon realizes that it was Well who moved it. The two laugh at the idea of the youngest Baumeister thinking that he could have any magical aptitude. Well continues his training with Alfred and this time, he's trying his hand at fire magic. Alfred flies in and commends the boy's efforts. He also gathered some vegetables for Well since he told his family that he's going out to look for vegetables. His mentor's efforts don't absolve him from suspicion though. At dinner, Well's father asks how he got one of the vegetables since it only grows on the other side of the river. There's no bridge there either, so how did he cross it? Did he use… magic? Well panics at this, but he soon finds relief when his father laughs at his own joke. Kurt, on the other hand, is suspicious of the little five-year-old. Meanwhile, Well's magic lessons with Alfred continue. He's flying while carrying Well in his arms, teaching him tracking spells. This time, the boy's target is a bird. Once he gets the hang of it, Well sends a shard stone to track and pierce the bird. Alfred seems bemused by this, but goes along the kid's wish to grill the bird. Well's overjoyed to eat some good freaking food for once, and he invites Alfred to eat as well. The man is curious about the green thing he's putting on his food, and Well says that it's wasabi. Alfred tries it out, but he puts a crap ton of it on his food. Uh-oh. Well looks just about ready to freak out, but lucky for him, Alfred seems to be enjoying his absurdly spicy bird. While eating, Alfred warns him not to go too deep into the forest, since the enchanted forest is home to lots of monsters and… 
But before that, more wasabi, please. Well is once again horrified as Alfred drowns a sacrilegious amount of wasabi. Is he inhuman? Did the first batch burn his taste buds off? Anyway, Alfred continues, saying that the forest is home to foodstuffs and herbs one won't find elsewhere. Many people still waltz into them looking to get rich quick, and they never come back. Well opens up that he feels like Kurt has been watching him lately, and Alfred suggests that he must have realized that Well has magic and is afraid to lose his succession rights. Lordship sounds like a pain to Well, especially if it'll just cause trouble with Kurt. Alfred suggests that he try adventuring since his adaptability would make him an ideal candidate. He would know as he used to be an adventurer himself. And he can see that Well has what it takes to enjoy what the wide world has to offer. As Well is savoring the idea of being an adventurer, a dark light and fog-like construct appears in front of Alfred's arm. He can only think, please, not yet, I need a little more time. That night at dinner, Well tells his family that he wants to become an adventurer. He's thinking of enrolling in the Adventurer's Academy once he turns 12. His words are met with a mixed reception. His mother worries since it's too far. Kurt smirks, relieved that his lordship won't be challenged. And his father, well, he brings up one teeny tiny conundrum here. They don't have enough money to enroll him in the Adventurer's Academy. The next day, Alfred tells his mentee that the Dukedom of Breitschberg is a mercantile town where even children can join merchant guilds and sell what they gather. Well says that he can earn his tuition that way. However, the town is quite far away and he'll need to learn traveling magic too, which involves flight magic. Once more, he carries Well and they fly high up to see the world. Alfred tells Well that it's what awaits him when he becomes an adventurer. When Alfred is alone at night, the black fog surrounds him and it's much bigger than before. The man appears to be in pain too. The next morning, Well is practicing his flight magic. Alfred tells him that his training ends the next day. Taken aback by the news, Well's magic deactivates and he falls to the ground. He asks his master why he would end his training so abruptly, and Alfred tells him that it's not abrupt. He assures the young boy that he'll be fine. Well isn't convinced, seeing as they've only been training for two weeks, but Alfred shoots him down. At dinner, Well's dad says that he heard there's a whispering dead spotted in the woods. The whispering dead is an undead that has retained its cognitive abilities. It can even hold conversations. It is said that they don't look very different from humans, but they're still corpses. Their bodies go cold, their senses stop functioning, and their skin grows terrifyingly pale. Well grows perturbed as he remembers that Alfred spends his entire time in the forest. His dad adds that in a few years, whispering deads lose their minds and become zombies that hunt people to sate their hunger. That night, Well goes out into the woods to look for his master. Though he still can't control it well, he uses his flight magic to look for him. When he sees Alfred, he immediately tells him about the whispering dead in the forest. He asks him to go with him to their mansion since it's dangerous there, but Alfred only tells him that it's alright. The danger he's speaking of doesn't exist, since he's the Whispering Dead. Not the point, but I guess we now know that he is not human. That's why he can handle that much wasabi. The boy is in complete denial, but Alfred continues. It happened five years ago. The eldest son of the previous duke contracted a deadly illness. The duke headed to an enchanted forest to look for a panacea that could cure him, and he had his court magician Alfred in tow. They had an army of 2,000, but the monsters outnumbered them. He was forced to fight while protecting the duke and troops. Soon, his mana ran out and he was overwhelmed. Though his life was coming to an end, Alfred had a deep regret burning in him. It's that deep regret that turned him into a whispering dead. When a whispering dead's wish is fulfilled, they pass on. And his wish? It's to meet someone he could pass the magic he learned in 30 years to. Since Wells just five years old, Alfred thought that he would run away if he told him that he was a whispering dead, so he lied on the spot. He then asks for the child's forgiveness. All this is a lot for little Well to take in, but Alfred isn't done. His mentor tells him that he wants to confirm that he was the person that he's been seeking, and so, he must take his final test. The test? To purge Alfred. For his final lesson, Alfred will teach Well the holy magic used to purge the undead like him. It's hard, but he doesn't want to lose his sanity and become a zombie that attacks people. Though Well's heart breaks to do this, he tearfully purges the man who taught him everything he knows. In the end, Alfred seems content. Content that his life is ending by his disciples' hands. Before he disappears, Alfred tells him to remember the thing he taught him in those two weeks. Your life is only beginning. He tells Well, do your best and do it smartly. After those words, Alfred disappears. He can now rest peacefully. Well lets himself cry, before telling his master that he'll give doing his best and doing it smartly a shot. Seven years pass and Well is now a 12-year-old boy, leaving home for Breitschberg to attend the Adventurer's Academy. In Breitschberg at the Adventurer's Academy, a girl introduces herself as the third daughter of the Overweg family, the instructors of martial arts in the Dukedom of Bleichroder. Her name is Louise Joland Aurelia Overweg. As she talks, Well sits on his own in the corner. 
He thinks to himself that he spent the last seven years at home in solitude. He's kept his distance from others and lived by himself to prevent any problems with succession. Meanwhile, another girl introduces herself as the third daughter of the Hillenbrand family, the instructors of spearmanship in the dukedom of Blytroder. She's Ina Suzanne Hillenbrand. Next up is Wells' turn, and he introduces himself as cheerfully as he could. He tells them to call him well if they want to. His introduction is met with his classmates' straight faces. Well thinks he overdid it with the nickname thing. The first thing they do at class is to fill out a party registration form. Next month, they'll begin training in parties. Well worries since he's not good with group activities. At lunch, he feels left out as he has no one to share a table with. He's practically a loner. On another table, Ina mentions that Well is that year's only scholarship student of magic. Louise adds that she's heard Well's magic power is already on par with top-class adventurers. A dude chimes in saying that he heard that the magic instructor decided there was nothing more he could teach him and he gave up on instructing him. Well, that's not really true. His teacher didn't want to be a zombie, so he had to act fast. The powerful part is true, though. He adds that if they party up with him, they're set up for life. Since most parties formed at the academy tend to stay together even after graduation, a powerful magician like Well would be a really good ally. And it looks like everyone is thinking the same thing. Erwin von Arnim lays out a proposal for the two girls. He thinks Well is trying to decide if they're worthy of a great mage like him. Louise incorrectly assumes that it's the reason why he's always alone. Oh dear. This powerful mage you speak of just has no lick of interpersonal skills whatsoever. He's not appraising anyone at all. Anyway, Erwin tells Louise and Ina that if they, the top of their field, team up with him, the top swordsmen, maybe Well might recognize them. Meanwhile, Well is practicing what to say to his classmates. But then he sees the three earlier talking with three boys. The three boys are laughing, so he assumes that they're all having fun and maybe not interrupt. God, this kid. Back at the kids of Duke's table, the three boys are actually taunting them because they overheard their plans. The three boys, called the Axe Trio, are confident that Well would join their party, not theirs. At class, the teacher says that since some of them don't receive a stipend from their family, they have to do part-time jobs. The school recommends hunting and that they do it in groups. Well despairs again. Why should everything be done in groups? He doesn't fit in anywhere. Well, many people want to be in a group with you, you just don't know it. Like Louise, Ina, and Erwin. They're looking at Well and calculate how to approach him. Ina says that he's not talking to anyone. Erwin assumes that it's a challenge from Well. According to him, this is what Well is saying. You should have no trouble bringing in more prey as a group than I could hunting alone. Erwin can be a writer. He has so many wild ideas swirling in that blonde head of his. Ina, to her credit, seems unconvinced with his reasoning. After the students have completed their hunt, they present their praise to a guy who then gives them money in exchange for it. Despite hunting alone, Well has the biggest catch of all. His classmates think the difference in his abilities and theirs is too much that they give up forming a party with him. One of the Axe Trio boys says that it's not worth it. He tells Erwin that if you're not the eldest son, it's wiser not to dream of more. Well musters up his courage to invite his classmates to grab a bite with him, only to find an empty room. Poor boy. That night, Ina and her group talk about what the Axe Boy said. The three of them are all born later in life, not the eldest children of their families. This means that there's no chance they can inherit the title and kingdom. The situation is a bit worse for Louise and Dina, as they have higher mana capacity than normal. Not enough to use magic, but enough to reinforce their skills. This made them stronger than the men in their family, so they started to avoid them. Ina, incensed by this talk, stands and bangs her hands on the table. Why on earth does being born later mean we're not allowed to dream, she says. Preach, Ina. That's just crazy. So, she's resolved. They should just hunt even bigger animals in order to gain Well's recognition. Erwin and Louise agree to her proposition. The next day, they go to the forbidden area of the forest. Ina says that they should go back, but it's too late. They're immediately surrounded by a pack of extra-large wolves. They prepare for battle. Meanwhile, in another area of the forest, Well spots Ina's group with the wolves through his magic. He thinks that if these people are his classmates, maybe they can become friends if he saves them. Back to the three. They're fighting well, but there's just so many of the wolves. Erwin eventually gets injured for protecting Louise from a wolf. Before more wolves can attack and eat them, boulders spring out of the ground and keep them safe from the wolves. They then see Well in the air, asking if they're okay. At the academy, Erwin admits to Well that they were trying to get him to recognize them. Well is surprised to hear this. Louise says that after seeing the magic he used earlier, she realized they really do live in different worlds. She adds that she's giving up on forming a party with him. Well tries to object, but their teacher arrives and tells them that all students of the scholarship class have been invited to a garden party hosted by the Duke of Blytroder. The Duke is currently one of the nobles competing for the top in the Kingdom of Helmut. One of their classmates says that they're obviously getting invited because the Duke wants to lay claim to Well. Ina says that there's still a chance the Duke will recognize them. 
the axe boy from earlier, a certified killjoy, tells them that the Duke's just there to lay claim on Well. So, there's no reason to get excited. Well just silently sits in a corner as he listens to his classmates chatter. He's holding the party application form. At the garden party, the Duke personally introduces himself to Well. His name is Amadeus Freytag von Bleischroeder. The Duke invites him to have a chat and Well asks that Ina's group be included too. He says that they are his party members. Take that, Axe Boys! Together with the three, Well meets Duke Amadeus' court magician, Brantag Ringstadt. The Duke says that Brantag is the teacher to his former court magician, Alfred Rainford. Oh, Well's meeting his mentor's mentor. Cool! Brantag is a talented user of tracking magic. He is able to track the magic power of anyone he's met in person over great distances. Brantag says that it was seven years ago when Alfred's presence suddenly disappeared. He remembers Alfred saying, I want to meet someone whom I can pass on all the magic I've learned. He thought it over and realized that if it was the wish he had clung to, then it was never coming true. Alfred had a greater magic capacity than his master and he was counted amongst the top five magicians on the continent. There was no way he would ever find a magician he could recognize as his disciple. Yet now, here is a man with incredible magic power from the very same region where his presence disappeared. A man carrying his magic bag, no less. Brantag says that no one could use that magic bag unless Alfred himself had transferred ownership. He asks Well, you're it, aren't you? You're Alfred's disciple. Said disciple confirms it. Brantag asks him what his final moments were like. Well replies that he purged his master before he became a zombie. Brantag face palms. What a thing to be forced upon a child. He then pats Well's shoulder and thanks him for letting Alfred pass on peacefully. Well's overwhelmed with emotion for a bit. Then, he returns Alfred's magic bag which contains items meant for the 2,000-man expedition to the Enchanted Forest. In the school grounds, Ina, Louise, and Erwin contemplate about the stuff about Well that they have just heard. Ina says that they really didn't know anything about Well. Erwin recalls Well saying that he lived by himself to avoid succession struggles. Well runs to them, apologizing for the wait and for springing the party thing on them. Then, Ina bursts out that they don't deserve to be in a party with him. Erwin confesses that they were all planning to use him to make him a tool to improve their own lives. Well replies that it kind of goes both ways. He said that he dragged them along without warning because he didn't want to go anywhere alone with an old guy of the Duke's standing. They're shocked to hear this, and he explains that he did really want to be in a party with the three of them. When asked why, he replies that it seems like he'd have fun with them even when things get tough. He adds that long ago, his master told him that he has what it takes to enjoy what the wide world has to offer. So he thought it would be good to have friends who could enjoy it with him. The three laughs in unison with Erwin, saying that he can't believe that's what he'd recognize them for. The Duke approaches them and says that Well's reward for returning the supplies is 1,000 gold coins. The three gets shocked at this. Well, too. But he has to convert it into Japanese yen to comprehend how much money that is. Brantag adds that Alfred has his own estate, and they've made arrangements for him to inherit it. That night, we see Well eating dinner alone in a huge mansion. Chateau? Palace? We'll call it a big house. As he's eating, he tells himself that it's too big for a student living alone. He stares at his party application form, which has Zena, Louise, and Erwin's names, and wonders if anyone will share it with him. Blessings just keep coming for Well, and this is just the start of his path towards becoming an adventurer, towards seeing all the things the wide world has to offer, just as his master would have wanted for him. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.